we're going to turn to our esteemed panelists here. Uh, we have about 10 minutes worth of panel discussion. So I'll start off with Jeff. Uh, you know, we heard some four great presentations. What do you take away from, uh, from this? So I, I agree with you. These were four really interesting presentations. And what I take away is that there are promising therapies out there that may help us get farther than we are right now. It's interesting that these therapies really came on the scene, what, 12, 13, 14 years ago, and here we are now, still, those initial therapies are the gold standard, and we still haven't found something to really push us over that hurdle. Hopefully, these therapies, one or several of them, will help us get above that so we can start tackling these patients who have some responses but not fully and maybe start getting both better visual acuity outcomes and maybe better durability. Yeah, thank you. So Praveen, a follow-on question, you know, us retina specialists, we want to save every letter, um, you know, how much is, how, what do you think if we were to get one of these therapies and it helps improve three letters or five letters, uh, you know, it's incremental, it's not another three line gainer. How, how would you see, you know, from our perspective as physicians, we want to serve, save every letter, but how do you think that would play out? So I, I think it's very valuable. I'm not really sure it's a fair question. I know we think that way, but I'm not really sure it's a fair question for, for several reasons. Uh, you know, one is, look, if there's a three letter difference and that made the difference between me being able to drive and not drive, or live independently, and that would matter a lot. And there's a big difference in Phoenix whether you can drive or not drive. Uh, the second thing is that if the mean improvement is three letters of vision, that means that there's a bunch of people who improved a lot more. And if we can figure out who those people are, you know, that would also be very valuable. But I think what we'll also find is for a long time we've talked about the silo between efficacy and durability and which one is better, and we've always said, look, efficacy rules and rules over everything. To a certain extent, that's true, but if you think of this, these things as being stocks, I think the stock of durability is highly undervalued. And I think what we'll realize is that if we can, man if we can find a sustainable treatment regimen that's sustainable, durability will be evenly valued or valued fairly. And I think you're seeing that already. If you look at the Novartis announcement, for instance, in regards to durability, if you look at a lot of talks that were given today by David and Charlie, and are regarding uh, durability, I think you'll see that that value is going to come up. Yeah, Dave, what, what do you think about durability versus efficacy, that whole uh, balance? Where, where do you see it? Sure. So, you know, unfortunately, the agency has put the bar at, at visual acuity and uh, in any combination product. And the only one that, that goes outside of that in this discussion is the BIFAB from Roche is be, will be a non-inferiority trial because it's going to be considered a new molecule, not necessarily a combination. A combination like everything else we've seen, including or including tyrogenics, anything that you bolt on to an anti-VEGF has to have a visual acuity rise to meet superiority to get approved. Once you get a pony in the horse race though, I think durability is what raises market share. Uh, the majority of us treat with treat and extend if you extend further and further, patients love coming to my office, but they'd love to come less often. If you can get that durability out there, it will conquer the one or two potential letters uh, that hopefully you get at the same time. Hopefully you get them both together. That's the holy grail. Uh, it's unlikely to my mind that you're going to get less efficacy with more durability. Uh, uh, if you don't get the increased efficacy, though, in visual acuity, we may be close to the ceiling that durability, hopefully we can get drugs approved because that's what my patients want. So when we're talking about durability, and that's really going to be covered in the next uh, panel as well, what are you looking for? Where do you feel comfortable with how often would you like to see Mrs. Jones? I mean, is it every six months? Is it every year? Is it every three or four months? And where does that, where does that land? So maybe, Jeff, you want to... Yeah, right now, there are at least 50% or not more of our patients are dosed somewhere between four and eight weeks. And then we've got another batch that maybe is eight to 12, and that rare amount that's longer. So 50, 60% of our patients are coming quite frequently. If I could get them to quarterly as opposed to every month or every six or eight weeks, that's a big difference the majority of the patients. If, so to me, three months is sort of that first real target. 
Obviously, six months would be ideal, and many of these diseases like diabetes, which it's a younger patient population, it's very difficult for them to take off work and miss all that time. So every step along the way makes a big difference, but even just three months, and we saw that from the response to the uh, recent data with possibly going every three months with the Novartis agent. Right. Any additional comments? Every, every week matters. If you have a patient that requires every four weeks and they go to five weeks, it doesn't sound like much, but you're going from 13 visits a year to 10 visits a year. Those three visits where their daughter has to take off work as a second grade teacher and come sit in my office and take their mom, those three visits make a difference. So a week matters. Yeah, I would love to get to three months, but I'll take any incremental increase in keeping a dry retina. So at the end of the day, I think what's important to realize is that in these studies, the number of injections are not a proxy to treatment burden, although that's the way the studies have to be done. It takes a few seconds to inject. The treatment burden is having to wait and see us and so on and so forth. So all these patients look the same. We have no idea who can be extended or not. And I think what you'll find is that there'll be more and more protocols that are designed, like the Novartis protocol, where there is a disease activity assessment so that we have a validated scientific means of looking at these patients whose phenotypes are always the same and saying, okay, based on this type of validated scientific disease activity assessment, I can extend you or not. And I think more and more trials are going to incorporate that kind of a protocol. And I think what you'll find is that the, uh, the, the, the trial that, where the, uh, the press release was recently released, the Hawk and Harrier trial, will be the first of many of those uh, where such disease assessment will be made. You know, one big problem for us is the FDA has been clear that just reducing the number of injections is not an approvable endpoint. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in many of the discussions, they'll point to a lot of literature which fairly shows that the farther we get away from regular therapy, whether it's monthly or PRN with monthly follow-up, the worse the outcomes. And they point to that and say, you're pushing for less injections, and yet everything we see says less injections means less visual acuity outcome. Once we can show that we can increase durability but maintain these outcomes, I think then we're going to start to look at a different outcome from the FDA standpoint. Oh, very fair point. So we, we started this discussion really being focused on the patient, the vision gains, the, the durability. Uh, I'm, I like the technical aspects too, so let me ask you guys some technical questions. Um, you know, what about bispecific versus co-formulation? Praveen, do you have any thoughts on that? We've heard that. Uh, any pros and cons? Well, it, it, there's not a right and wrong way. And first of all, I think the, all these pathways that we talked about today are, are, are really, really interesting. And it's, it gives me great comfort to know that there are two great companies, Regeneron and Roche, that are going after the same target. Uh, but there are hypothetical con considerations as to something that's bispecific and something that's a co-formulation. The advantage to a co-formulation is that you have a known entity, right? You've got ILEA, which is true and tried, and that's a known entity. The other advantage to a co-formulation is that if you have an excessive amount of ligand of one versus the other, then you can co-formulate accordingly. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case in the eye. Uh, the, uh, the concentration of ANCH2 and VEGF8 are fairly close. They're between 15 and 1,000 picomolar per mil. The advantage of a bispecific product, although it's very difficult to make, as uh, Charlie pointed out, uh, is that it has one clearance rate. And that's a, if you truly believe that you need dual inhibition for the best result, you want to have one clearance rate, although it's a much harder molecule to make. But then again, as I say, it gives me great confidence that there are two great companies going after the same target. So we'll see what happens. But these are hypothetical considerations. Any comments from? Well, another potential advantage there is if both of those work, at least my understanding, the bispecific is not a combination therapy. It's a monotherapy. And combination therapies, by definition, you need to demonstrate superiority and just decreasing injections isn't that superiority, so it would need to be efficacy. Whereas if you have a monotherapy agent, you can have non-inferiority. Demonstrate non-inferiority, but you may prove durability, and that would be approvable. So right. one, one practical consideration of the combination is by having two different proteins at, that, are, that are pretty large, the viscosity of the injection is a lot higher. And so it's more injection pressure to put in the eye. It's, it's different. 
Uh, the the, the bispecific uh, does not have that as much because it's one molecule. The downside of this bispecific is it can bind to either the ANG2 or the, or the VEGF. And if you do have a situation where you had increased ANG2, you might use up all your drug on that and have less anti-VEGF than what you'd like to control. So those are all hypothetical. We'll see how it plays out. Mark, we should point out that Dave also mentioned that because as he's gotten older, the, the greater viscosity has been harder for him to inject. So his younger partners like Charlie have had to do that for him. Yeah. And, 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 and <laughs> And finally, it should also be pointed out that you know, your, your, your consideration is correct, but Roche has done a study looking at the steric binding of both, that if one is open sterically, the other one can bind as well. We can build a little assistive device for you, Jeff, and all of us actually. Uh, so that brings me to the last question, which is um, sequential versus, um, you know, um, separate versus same time therapy. Can you comment on that? I mean. We've heard about sequential or simultaneous. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts around that, Praveen? Well, you know, I, I think, first of all, I think it's the, we talked about the ANG2 pathways, but the other two pathways that I think are really exciting because those pathways are validated from, a, from an oncologic systemic point of view. There's robust data to show, for instance, that uh, if you have VEGFA, that's a ligand that will bind to VEGF receptor 1 and 2, which will upregulate VEGF C and D, and C and D will bind to VEGF 2 and 3, 2 being a one that, that's very important to angiogenesis. So it makes sense that that may provide a redundant escape pathway. So to go after that makes absolute sense. As far as the integrin part is concerned, that too also has a very strong anti-inflammatory effect but not so much of an anti-permeability effect. So the sequential injection of giving the VEGF, anti-VEGF-A first, followed by a very, very potent, durable uh, compound that will stabilize inflammatory cells and stabilize vessels and last for a long time, as has been demonstrated in the Del Mar study, makes sense. So both of these companies, I think, it's not just the ophthalmic part, but they're coming from a robust amount of science that exists in the systemic literature. So uh, it makes sense to repurpose it for our purposes. From a clinician practice standpoint, and I'm the head of practice management for the ASRS, a bigger difficulty is going to be able to get insurers to let me do two injections within a short period of time. Already, our CMS carrier, as our others, are screening, and any injection within a 28-day period, they basically don't pay for the most expensive one. And so you're going to have to figure out a way to get around that. An oral product, uh, an eye drop like or one of those would be different if it was out of our Part B Medicare. Uh, but two expensive drugs in the same period of time will take some uh, manipulating of the CMS carriers and insurers to be able to tolerate. And I have some big concerns about that. I think this is very much like what we've seen in oncology. The oncologists are years ahead of us in this approach. They started with single agents. They've gone to uh, sort of multiple agents in certain disease states. We see a lot of these study patients, and there's this insight into understanding that you attack different pathways at different times is certainly out there, and a lot of virtually all of our drugs have come from oncology at some point or another. So I think Dave's right. It's certainly an issue, but I think there's also precedence out there to looking at it, and hopefully if we get that success, we'll be able to address it as oncology has. And, and Jeff, I think you're exactly right, but to Dave's point, um, we've been really, really good, I think, at doing stuff to advance science. We haven't so much been good at showing how well we've been doing. And Mark, I know you're leading this effort in the SRS to, from a holistic point of view, to say what have we actually done in terms of the quality of life that we've given to our patients. And that translates entirely into value. And that's a very big study that I know that you're leading in the SRS. But that kind of approach, I think we need more and more of so that someone like Dave can go to CMS and say, here's the value of what we've done and those are big and very, very important studies. We just haven't done them. And if we can have industry partner with us in a group like the ASRS to help us do that, that would be a benefit to all of us, including our patients. Yeah, and that, that's uh, something that maybe the audience doesn't know, but uh, we at the AS ASRS are really taking a lead in that and identifying how much vision is worth, not just um, you know, qualities, but beyond that uh, in life and how that relates to some of the other specialties like in oncology and other things. So um, that's a very important study that we are doing and um, 
will um, you know, keep you apprised of that. So with that, I think this panel is a wrap. Thank you for, to the panelists uh, for participating, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>